subject the proper conclusion amen but you got to think big to see this you got to see it uh, from the top down from God's perspective if God be for us who can be against us proper conclusion bless us now Lord in Jesus name may we preach that which become of sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. The proper conclusion. In one statement, in this one statement, the Apostle Paul, this learned teacher, this man with brilliant insight and a brilliant thinker, a very astute man, a man so learned that he called himself a Pharisee of Pharisees, had dedicated his life to Phariseeism until the Lord Jesus saved him and he walked away from it all. Such a dedicated Hebrew that he was called a Hebrew of Hebrews. The Apostle Paul wasn't just great um, in the eyes of commoners. The Apostle Paul was great and admired by his peers. Amen. Saul of Tarsus, who when he met Jesus, everything changed after meeting the Lord. This brilliant Thinker, this man with also brilliant divine insight into the mysteries of God. God unfolded to Paul mysteries, secrets that he kept to himself, secrets that he wouldn't give Daniel, mysteries, secrets, and answers that he didn't give Moses. That he wouldn't give to, they didn't give to any of the other apostles and disciples. Do you know we learn more about the importance of the communion from Paul than any other writer in the Bible or any of the other disciples who wrote books in the Bible? even though the other disciples who wrote books in the Bibles, in the Bible were actually at the communion table who enjoyed the Last Supper with Jesus, who sat there in the upper room with him, yet we learn more about the communion from Paul, who was at that time Saul, the Pharisee, the enemy of Christ. Yet God has given this man, gave him more insight than he gave to the others concerning the communion and even the ministry of grace. Oh, yes. The, he, Paul was called to be the minister to the Gentiles. God gave him more than he gave any of the others. This man with brilliant insight into the mysteries of God, after pondering some things, in our text, he comes to the only act appropriate and suitable and reasonable conclusion, which was a proper one. The only fitting the duck deduction, excuse me, to the things that God had already done, Paul said is this. If omnipotence is working on our behalf, no lesser power can defeat his program. 
Isn't that something? Sense omnipotence, the almighty, all-powerful one, is working on our behalf. No lesser power. No lesser power online, in social media, on television, in your home, in your family, in your body. No lesser power. Around the street, on the campus of the university, no lesser power can defeat God. What a fitting, proper conclusion. Good God Almighty. What a, what a motto uh, to live by. But to, to see this and to actually put this into practice and to practice it when times get hard, you have to think big. You have to think by and respond by seeing things from God's perspective. King Saul got rejected because he panicked. Samuel said, wait till I get there. Seven days had passed and Samuel had not arrived and the fire had gotten tight and a great sense of urgency had come and Saul is looking around, he don't see Samuel, he don't know what to do and you know what he does? Instead of waiting, he acted. He should have said, if omnipotence is working on my behalf, no lesser power can defeat me. This is the kind of thinking which causes us to reach conclusions about life that keep us sound, strong, secure, and safe. Everybody wants to have that feeling of well-being. Everybody wants to feel that everything is going to be all right. Life can shake you. This kind of thinking keeps you in that place where you know, regardless of what's going on, you're safe in the Lord's arms. Amen. This is why Paul said, among other reasons, Paul said to the saints at Thessalonica, be not soon shaken in mind. Don't you let the devil play a mind game on you. Don't you let Satan give you a sense of urgency that is not real. Don't let the devil pull you to where he wants you to be. Mm -mm, can't do that. But that's easy to happen and it's more likely that it will happen than not unless you follow God and follow the apostle in this big picture way of seeing things. Are you following me? Now you got to remember for those who've been following the ministry, that this particular section began with uh, Paul doing some mental gymnastics. Paul says in verse 18 of Romans uh, chapter 8, For I reckon, to reckon is to put a thing together in your own mind. All of us uh, think. Praise the Lord. Amen. All of us uh, I believe it was President Obama who said that he sets aside a certain amount of time to think, just for thinking, reasoning things out. I was talking to someone the other day, and they said to me that they, what they enjoy when they're driving on long trips, uh, it was you, uh, Mr. Michelle Moe, says, uh, while I'm driving, it gives me a chance to just think. Yeah. I said, Bishop, I like sometimes driving alone. 
Because sometimes when somebody's riding with me, they talk the whole time. <laughs> or, or they may want to play music the whole time. And so that's my time to just think things through. Amen. All of us have different ways of finding time to ponder things, to put things together uh, in your mind. Am I right about that? Yes. Praise the Lord. If, if you don't, please do, uh, because life, life, life is complicated. Especially, yeah, life is complicated. And, and, and God wants you. I, I've often said it. Thank God for Sister Camper uh, in her wonderful uh, welcoming remarks today. Christianity is the ultimate thinking man's religion. You have to think to be a good Christian. Amen. You have to think. And, and the Lord, you have to think and you have to be uh, 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 educated to a degree because he sends you to so many places to learn life's lessons. The Bible says go and study the ant. All kind of places. He, he brings up the weather. Brings up the behavior of animals. Brings up all kinds of things to teach lessons. Well, if you don't know about those things, you'll read the scripture, but you'll never go and look. So then the lessons that the Lord is trying to teach, you never learn. Right. Amen. And it's so, so important that you get these things. Paul said in verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. The greatest shame we endure, that we may endure for Christ here on earth, will be a mere trifle when he calls us forth and publicly acknowledges us before the host of heaven. What a day that will be when Jesus, before the host of heaven, point at me or point at you and say, that's my guy or that's my gal. For they stood for me before men. They acknowledged me before men. Now I'm going to acknowledge them before my father and the holy angels. Mighty Gabriel be, will be standing there. And the mighty Michael, praise God, and the heavenly host of angels. That angel that God sent that wiped out 185,000 men in one night. All of them will be standing there and we got to stand in front of them and God himself and Jesus will say, I know him. Ain't nobody going to be talking about it. I want to tell him all about my troubles. Tell him how I made it over. You going to say, Whew. thank you for knowing me. Thank you for acknowledging me. Oh my, one, just one moment in God's kingdom will pay for it all. Oh, I, I, I want to get publicly acknowledged by Christ before the heavenly host. Even the extreme excru excruciating pain of the martyrs will seem like pin pricks when the Savior graces their brow with the crown of life. When Jesus himself places that crown on your head, on the head of the martyrs, Amen. When, when Christ uh, is your tailor and he puts on that robe and, and the robe fits you well because you tried it on at the gates of hell. What a day. Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And then he says, and you know, you can't see it, but it's coming. And in the meantime, he says, and you know something else? The Spirit of God prays for us. He helps our infirmities, for we know not what to pray for as we are. In verse 26, but thank God that the Holy Ghost, he talks to the Father, on our behalf 
and he says everything that needs to be said, the way it should be said. Amen. It's a, it's a heavenly conversation, and it's done through groanings, which cannot be uttered. When he thought about that, Mother Turner, he came to another place. He says something that's, that's just grand. He says uh, concerning these things, and now we know that all things work together for good. Am I right? For good to them that love God and to them who are uh, uh, to, to them who are called according to his purpose. That's the 28th verse. I'm, I'm almost through. Amen. It may not always seem so. Sometimes when we are suffering heartbreak, tragedy, disappointment, frustration, bereavement, we wonder what good can come out of this. But the following verse gives us the answer. Whatever God permits to come into our lives is designed to conform us to the image of his son. When we see this, it takes the question mark out of our prayers. When you understand that whatever happens in life is God's way of shaping us and conforming us to the image of Christ, you see uh, your trial much differently. Our lives are not controlled by impersonal forces such as chance and luck and fate, but by our wonderful personal Lord who is too loving to be unkind and too wise to error. What a mighty God we serve. He does these things because he knew us before we knew him. And, uh, and he predetermined certain things. I love uh, verse 29. It says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his son that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. You know, if you read verse 29 alone, it sounds like that the Lord selected some and that the Lord rejected others. And if you lift this verse out of its context, then that's exactly the way it reads. It, it, then it makes Calvin right. And, and, and Calvin... Uh, in Calvinism, they believe that is already predetermined. That God has rejected some and accepted others. And no matter what, if you're on the rejection list, you're out. And if you're on the accepted list, you're in. And the funny thing about Calvin was, Calvin thought most of the folk who looked like us were already rejected. And folk that, who looked like him was accepted. That's the way this reads lifted out of context. But if you take it and place it back to its contextual setting, then you see that uh, nothing could be further from the truth. See, the Bible says, and now we know that all things worketh together for good to them that love the Lord and to them who are called according to his uh, purpose for the conjunction for links verse 28 to verse 29 so you got to keep them linked to understand what the apostle is saying this part of my preaching uh, put the, the, the student who's not a serious bible student to sleep but for those of us who love this kind of stuff let me just for about five of you, let me explain what the apostle is, is saying. See, because some of us want to know, praise the Lord, uh, uh, what the Bible says about these things. Because, you know, a lot of people uh, mistreat folk. Bless you, my friend. We mistreat people and we mistreat God. You hear a lot from parents. Yeah, the Lord's going to save him after a while. Talk about their wayward son or wayward daughter. When God gets ready, God's going to save him. 
Amen. Because I've been praying, and uh, when the Lord, they're running because God's not ready. So, okay, he, he robbed that bank because God ain't ready to save him. So then God's to blame. Oh, yeah, he's a liar because God's not ready to stop him from lying yet. That's the problem. The problem is the Lord's not ready. Oh, see, that's, that's, that's believing. That's Calvinism. Amen. That's taking the responsibility from the individual and putting it all on God's shoulders. And it assumes that the only reason that the rest of us are saved is because God wanted us saved. And the only reason the others aren't is because he's not ready for them to be saved yet. So then how do you explain when they get killed out there and they hadn't gotten saved yet? Oh, so well, God just didn't want them to be saved. Then. Well, if that's the case, then what's the point in having a preacher? What's the point in having a church? What's the point in any of this if it's already predetermined? This is for the serious Bible student. This part of my sermon doesn't go over well with those who attend church on Sunday only. Because you, you, you're waiting for me to get to the Lord giving you a new house, a new car. But for those who are serious about these things and serious about doctrinal issues, because the Bible warns that in the last days men would depart from the faith and men would not endure sound doctrine. And that's why most preachers don't preach doctrine anymore. Amen. Because men don't want doctrine. We don't, hear, we, don't, we don't need all that. We don't need all of that. Praise the Lord. Hurry up and let's get to the benediction. And let's shout for a minute so we can put a praise break on line and display that. But doctrinally speaking, let me explain something to you. See, the, the, the mystery is understanding the meaning of the word call in verse 28. Those who are called according to his purpose. That word call literally means not just those who were summoned. It can't mean those who were summoned. Because everybody has been summoned. Everybody, whosoever will, let him come. Go ye therefore in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go out and reach all nations. Am I right? So the Lord is calling everybody. So who are then the call? What's he talking about here? The call, word call there doesn't mean summoned alone. But the call there means those who were summoned, which is everybody. But those who replied and responded favorably to God's call. You see, you can't take free will out of this. That word call there puts free will back in. The Sunday I got saved, one of my cousins was sitting right beside me and she heard the same preacher I heard, the same gospel I heard. On the same day, we sat on the same row. She was right beside me. But her response to it was, I'm getting up and I'm getting out of this church. My response was, I'm getting up and I'm getting into the prayer line. Both of us had free will. I want to know today, how are you responding to God's call? How you respond determines everything. For everyone who responds to God's call and reject it, they're out. But everyone to everyone who will accept it, he predestinates. See, the predestination is to those who say yes. 
if you say yes to me, well, it's predestined. That everybody who says yes, I will work in their lives in such a way that they will be conformed to the image of my son. And to everybody that I have predestined, everybody I've called, I have justified. Everybody that I've justified, I've glorified. And then, well, who did you call? Everybody. I called everybody. But the question is, who said yes? There are people in here today, you, you're not saved today, and you'll walk out of here just like you came in. You'll say no. Well, well then you're not called. But there, there, hopefully there's somebody here today who will say, you know what? I've been running long enough. I want to say yes to Jesus. Well, once you say yes to Jesus, now you get on the predestinated train. Now you're on your way somewhere because everybody who gets on the train headed north to New York, praise God, if you get on the train, then you're going to New York. But you got to get on the train first. I thank God that in November of 1977, bring me up a little bit here, I got on the train. And you know what he's been doing ever since? He's been working on me. Oh, I've been a tough nut to crack. I've been hard-headed at times. Been just downright stupid at times. Dropped the ball at times. But he's been shaping me and making me and molding me and allowing things to happen to put me back in place. And oh, and I'm I'm on my way. I'm on my way to becoming in the natural what I already am in the spiritual. In the spirit, I'm justified. In the spirit, I, I am glorified. And I'm on my way. Oh, somebody tell God thank you. That's the way that works. You have a say in this thing. So, I heard Paul say, well now, after I consider all this, pondering all this, he throws out a question. Pondering with divine uh, thinking. Rapidly throwing one thing at after another at his readers. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time shall not be compared. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. And the whole creation is mourning and waiting for us to be glorified. Whoa. And somebody said, well, I don't see it. Well, you can't, you can't see it. But what a man, oh, he, a man don't hope for what he can't see. But oh, if we just wait patiently for it. And I know why you're waiting, you're going through, but you just got to wait on it because it's going to happen because God can't lie. Praise the Lord. He's going to do what he says. And while we're waiting, oh, I know why we're waiting. We're in these imperfect bodies who will go astray. But thank God the Spirit helping our infirmities the Holy Spirit oh he puts us back in place for we know not what to pray for as we are but the Holy Ghost comes in and helps us and the Holy Ghost searches the deep things of God and he talks to God on our behalf and we're on our way and when I think about this I know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and call according to his purpose for whom he did for no he did predestined and once he once 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 we said yes to the call we got on the train so what do we say to all these things look at your neighbors and neighbor what do you say to all these things See, when you understand these spiritual realities, how then, then do you respond to the reality, the troubles and the trials and the tribulations that you come against in this life? For there is what I know. And here is what I leave. Sister Evangela, I know these truths. 
But I'm living with a sickness in my body. I know these truths. But I'm unemployed right now. My money is funny. My train change is strange. I know these truths. But they're calling me a hypocrite online. I know. Oh, I know these truths. But sometimes I feel forsaken. And sometimes I feel all alone. So, what do I say? Paul said, what do we say to these things? And what I love about Paul, you know, he, he would take a chance, but just in case, just in case, just in case, he's got somebody in the church at Rome who was as dumb as me. Just in case, he's got a hard-headed Negro in the congregation who still won't get the answer right just in case somebody shout just in case he's got somebody who just can't see these things Paul says I'm not going to let you answer I'm going to answer because the conclusion that you got to come to is the right one so just in case there is somebody who will come to the wrong conclusion. Paul said, here's the right conclusion. If God be for us. for us who can be against us somebody ought to shout right there hallelujah hallelujah I'm here to tell you you don't have anything to worry about you don't have anything to worry about so one of the saints and she's here right now Text me the other day and said the doctor's got to check me out to see if there's cancer in my body. I sent her a text back and said, you're all right. You're healed already. Gonna be just fine. She texted me back, sent the text, I think it was last night or the night before, and said my test came back and everything is all right. God is a healer. He's a way maker. Yes, he is. Paul says, if God be for us, word for, can I just get simple? I know you know the definition, but for, if God be above us, if God is across from us, if God cares about us, if God has given us favor, if God benefits us, if he reigns over us, then who can be against us? And that answer is a great big no. Somebody shout, nobody! My God, it doesn't even matter. If the Lord's on your side, then it doesn't even matter what the devil tries to do. Why? Because number one, our God does not make empty promises. You see, let me tell you why you're gonna come through this. Let, let me tell you why you ought to shout today. Let me tell you why. I'll not wait until the battle is over. Mm, you see, here's why. Because we serve a God. I said we serve a God who has paid a dear price. We serve a God who has made a substantial investment in us. All of these things. All of these, these spiritual truths that I just finished telling you about, they all cost God the Father dearly. God the Father paid a huge price. He paid, oh God, he paid. He made a huge investment. He made the largest investment possible 
to, uh, to assure our glorification. What did he do? Paul says, he that spared not his own son. If for no other reason, I'm going to bring you out because I invested my son to cause you to be who I would have you to be. Don't you know that God is not going to let Jesus down the cross for us, rise again the third day, and then turn around and let the devil trample all over us. The devil is a liar. He's already paid too much. He's already invested too much. Good God Almighty, you ought to praise the Lord because he's already invested too much to let you go down. Yeah! you something and I want you to be honest now do you have a favorite garment favorite pair of shoes necktie dress or skirt that you wouldn't wear to go jogging in that you wouldn't wear to dig a ditch in that you wouldn't wear to clean the house in Somebody said, I wouldn't wear it. And you asked them why. They said, because I paid too much for it. I invested too much in it. It's not for that. These are not jogging shoes. These are preaching shoes. I paid too much for them to let you scuff them up. I've invested too much in my suit to take the thing off and throw it on the floor. Too much investment is in it. Hallelujah. Well, Jesus invested too much in me to leave me now. The Lord has invested too much in you. And I come to tell you that if you just hold on, I come to tell you if you just keep living right, I come to tell you if you just keep praising the Lord, then the Lord is gonna freely give you everything that you need. Yeah! Yes! Somebody praise him for his investment in you, for his goodness, for his kindness, and his tender mercy. I wish I had a few praises in here today. Woo! He paid to be on our side. The Bible said, 2 Corinthians uh, 5 and 19, to wit that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself. And not only did God give us Jesus, but Jesus gave himself. Paul said in Galatians 2 and 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God gave Jesus willingly for me and Jesus willingly gave himself for you and me in the cross. In the cross, the Father gave his dearest for his neediest. We needed the most. He gave the best. Good God Almighty, what do I say to what he's already done? 
If God be for me, he's more than the world against me. If God is for you, and he is, you've already won. You've already come out on top. The devil is already defeated. Wave your hands because he's healing your body, healing your muscles, healing your bones, healing your nerves, healing your eyes, healing. Yeah! Yeah! Think about it. Think about it. Think about this. To heal us, Sister McCoy, to heal us, Jesus didn't have to die. To drive cancer, to heal high blood pressure, to cure diseases, Jesus didn't have to die. All he had to do to do all that stuff is just be bruised. Just get hit. Get whooped. See, we're not healed by his death. We're healed by his stripes. Good God Almighty. Am I right about it? By his stripes, we are healed. Now, now, if he would take a, a whooping to give us, God Almighty, healing, but didn't stop there, he went and died. Glory. So that our sins could be forgiven. So if he would pay the ultimate price so that we can be saved, don't you know he'll back up and pay this little price right here to freely give you all things that you need in this life that pertains to life and to godliness. Lord, I need you to bring me out. Lord, I need you to bless my marriage. Lord, I need you to heal my child. Lord, I need you to work this, 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 and this. Lord, I need you to do these other things. Well, based on what he paid based on what he's already done it's nothing for him to back up and do this because this won't even require much from the Lord anyway and you know what to the Jew who read our text and I'm close to the Jew who read uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 to the Jew who read he that spared not his own son the first thing to the Jew who knew his history first thing came to his mind was Abraham see Paul knew the Jews would get that Abraham took his own son to prove his loyalty to the father his willingness to obey the father yes, took his son yes, sir. and offered his own son Isaac his only son his son born of his old age his son who was the son of promise his son hallelujah his son he offered him praise the Lord but God stopped him. But what he did was he proved that he was loyal to God. Well, God the Father, nobody stopped him. Abraham offered his son. For us, God the Father gave his son. Abraham was willing to go all the way. God the Father went all the way. So if he went all the way, if he will, has done all of this on our behalf, 
and for us. Then what is the conclusion in life? And so you know what I love about following God? The Bible always have me where I need to be. If you've been following this big picture uh-huh. preaching, then you know I didn't skip to this one to address all this craziness that's going on right now. Mm-mm. God knows everything. He already had me laid out. So how do I respond? He that spared not his own son. If he would let Jesus die for me and let Jesus die for you, don't you think this other stuff is already taken care of? It's got to be. It's got to be. All we got to do is just believe him and stand on the word of God. I want the, I want, I want the Lord, I'm done, to announce, uh, anoint me. Think like this. To see things from his vantage point. Amen. So that when life gets tough, when life gets unfair, when life gets a little unsettling, our minds revert back to what the Father has already done. And see, Peter promised us that the Lord would give us all things that pertaineth to life and to godliness. Second Peter 1 and 3 says, according to his divine power, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things, that pertain to life, this life, and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. There's a coming glorification to glorify. When God glorifies you, you know what God does when he glorifies you? Glorifying, one of the definitions is to recognize. To be glorified, to be recognized. God blesses you to be recognized. To have honor bestowed upon you is to be glorified by the God of the Bible. We, we're already glorified in the spirit, but God is glorifying us in the flesh. All we got to do is just trust him and live for him. And he will do the rest for us. Amen. When God, when the Lord glorifies you, he invests, look what he does, he invests dignity in you. There's an investment that he has made in us. And, and, and when he invests in you, no lesser power can take away, can take from you anything that God has already invested in you. Can't do it. Not won't, can't. Because he's almighty. But you got to think like this. Who am I preaching to today? Who is the devil challenging. Who have Satan rocked? Who, praise God, said to themselves while the word was going forth, that's what I needed. Glory to God. That's what I need. Oh, I, that, I, I can make it now. I just, I just gotta, I, I, I need God, the Holy Ghost. I need the Holy Ghost to keep in my mind. Maybe I need to write it, write it somewhere. Maybe I need to uh, do a few sticky notes and put some, uh, put, stick it on my refrigerator and put it on my bedside table and remind myself over and over and over and over that if God be for me, if God, if God. And then I, I heard my friend Elisha say to young 
Gehazi who was afraid because the Syrians had surrounded them. Oh my. Second Kings, glory to God, chapter 6. And uh, verse 13. Well, verse 14 says, Therefore sent he, this is the king of the Assyrians, because he was upset that every plan he made, Eli, Elisha knew about it and would warn the enemy. So he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may fetch him. And it was told him, Behold, saying, Behold, he is in Dotham. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night. So many things happen by night. In the spirit realm, there are always plans and things that take place unbeknownst to you. But nothing takes place unbeknownst to God. Elisha didn't know that, that, that they found him. And that while he's resting that night, they're laying an ambush for him. So you don't know, you don't know when life lays an ambush. There's so many things that God doesn't permit us to know. You know why he doesn't? We don't need to. If we knew, that's why I said Thursday, I, I thank all of you all and I appreciate you for your love and faithfulness and compassion. But I don't want you to feel that every time you find something online negative about me, that it's your job to send it to me. I, I actually intentionally sidestep all that stuff. Because who cares? It doesn't matter. In the end, some things you need to know, but not everything. Because if you, if you fill yourself up with all that junk, you can't hear God. I'm so glad that I didn't know until somebody told me last night that on the day that I preached in St. Louis that someone whom I've been kind to went out and called me a hypocrite. I didn't even know before I preached the gospel. Glory to God. That's, that's the Assyrians encamping by night. But God knew. He, 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 maybe that's why he had me in my room, away from everybody, left the board of bishops, went up, laid out my Bible and everything. And man, that, get that phone out of the way and just hear from the Lord. The Assyrians camping all around. And while you're sitting there talking to me, I'm not the only one the Assyrians are after. They, they, they ain't camping your life. Amen. So they surrounded him by night. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth his servant. Behold. It was a good servant. He got up first. It's bad when you beat your servant up. <laughs> and uh, I ain't going to preach about that. And a host compassed the city. Both with horses and chariots. And his servants said unto him. Alas, my master, what shall we do? What shall we do? And he said to him, fear not. See, what shall we do? The writers wrote it in the context that he also explained to him what had taken place. So when he said fear not, he already knew that they were encamped about him because the servant told him. So alas, what shall we do? The context there is the man told him. So it wasn't that he was in denial, but he, he had, as soon as he found out, his, his, the, the, the servant, 
his natural inclination was to get afraid. The man of God's natural inclination was to tell him, calm down. He said, fear not, for they that be with us. I should save this for next Sunday. That's, 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 that's a good preaching. That's a hooping scripture. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha He prayed. And he didn't pray about the enemy. He didn't pray for a plan. That's right. He prayed and, and, and said, Lord, Lord, I pray thee, open my servant's eyes. That he may see. Because he need to see what I see. That he may see. And you know what you know happened? And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw. There are some things you can't see. God opened his eyes and he saw. And behold, when he saw, behold, the mountain was full of horses. And chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the words of Elisha. If God is for you, all you got to do is see it. All you got to do is believe it and just know it. The altar is open. Pray for me, preacher, that God shift my thinking, that I embrace this, if God be for us, who can be against me? Glory to God. Omnipotence is on my side. No lesser power can stop the program of the Almighty. Somebody bring me my jacket there. Amen. Glory to God. I'm going to walk in victory. Thank you, sir. I'm going to walk in victory because the Lord has things for me. I'm going to walk in what he has for me. Because he has them for me. He's invested a whole lot in me. He's invested too much. Amen. You don't go, you don't go and get your motor rebuilt in your car. And put four new brand new tires on the car. Have your upholstery redone. And then trade it in. Because mm -mm, you're, you're not gonna recoup. No, sir. You've invested too much. Praise the Lord. 20 and 30 years into the marriage and you're going to get a divorce. Why would you do that? You've invested too much. Been serving the Lord for a long time. All these years of serving Jesus. And now you're talking about, well, I don't know. What? With all that I have invested in the Lord, and all that the law has invested in me, there is no way that I'm gonna stop now. <laughs>